everybody. Thanks for joining me. We are talking about the best of 2020. Even though it's 2021, I'm taking a look back at 2020. And this time, I kind of started to do this the other day, but I got distracted and had to end my stream early. So this time today, we are going to go through all of my picks for my favorite shows of the year that I watched, favorite movies I watched this year, and we'll wrap it up with my favorite books. Because last time, I did get to talk about my favorite books a little bit, but I didn't get to really get into the shows and movies too much. So we're going to start off with shows and movies. So in 2020, I watched like 171 movies and I kept track using these websites. I literally added all the shows I watched this year and all the movies. And in terms of shows, I watched um, over a thousand, it was like a thousand, a hundred and fifty something shows. And that's crazy. So not full shows. A lot of it's just random episodes. Some of it's just certain seasons of a show. And a very few of that number is basically a full show. Like, for instance, I watched All That There Is of Ozark in 2020. So season one, two, and three, for instance. So that took all, the, all that, the movies and the shows, turned out to be a total of like 800, 800 hours. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's kind of a lot, you know, that's kind of like absurd. Uh, a, a crazy big amount, you know, that's what, at least that's what I would say. So yeah, it's quite a lot, but uh, I think it was time well spent personally. So not everyone might think that when you're talking about watching movies and TV and stuff, but uh, me, I think it's a good thing. And so I want to thank you guys one more time until we were about to get into everything. And again, I would love to hear your favorite things you watched this year. And again, I'm not really talking about stuff that was released in 2020. I'm more talking about things that were that I watched in 2020. So not necessarily that was released in this year because I haven't watched a lot of new stuff. In, in 2020, it was kind of more, I was rewatching old stuff or maybe catching up on a show. There were some things, like you'll hear me talk about shows that I wish hadn't been canceled, which were shows that were from 2020 that I watched in 2020. And there will be actually my least favorite or most disappointing TV show I watched. I guess you could call it least favorite. And uh, that was also from 2020. So yeah, like some of the TV seasons that like I kind of talk about wanting to be back or not back that was released and watched in 2020. So other than that, though, everything's kind of random in terms of the time frame. So I guess it's kind of cheating a little bit because I'm calling it a best of 2020 when really it's like the best things I watched in 2020, regardless of the year it was released. But hey, again, as Nails has said many times to me, it's your show, your rules. So my rules and I'll break my own rules if I want to, I suppose. So whatever. And I will say, so the hours I spent watching TV and movies, about 800 and something hours, however much it is. It's on my blog. I did a whole blog post about, like, 2020 by the numbers, and it was astounding, really, all the numbers, looking at them on, like, my post. I was like, wow, it's kind of cool to see it all together, all these numbers like that. And so, I was really proud of that. I was like, oh, this is cool. But, um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of cool stuff to look back about 2020 and... Out of the 800 hours, I wasn't counting wrestling. So any wrestling I watched was not included. I didn't keep track of that because it's hard to. I didn't keep track of any of the sports I watched. So like any games that Paul were wa was watching that I watched or any hockey that I watched, it's not included. So we're talking about there's definitely more time spent than 800 hours last year watching TV and movies. Mostly TV because I couldn't keep track of even all the 60 minutes episodes I watched but almost everything else I kept track of. So the number 800 and something hours that includes almost everything except wrestling, sports, and randomly 60 minutes because we sure did watch a lot of 60 minutes. Kat said she loved all my numbers and my data on my blog post. Thanks Kat. So my favorite movie I watched in 2020 that I had never seen previously. So a new watch for me, but it's not a new movie. It's a very old movie, actually. Not very, very old, but considerably old. All right, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, of course. That's a Clint Eastwood movie. And Paul and I were supposed to have a mini Clint Eastwood marathon. However, we kind of only ended up watching two Clint Eastwood movies I would say in 2020. Yeah, yeah, in 2020. Because on New Year's Eve, we watched Gran Torino. So Gran Torino, I had just 
finished watching that before it, the clock turned and the calendar page turned to 2021. So Gran Torino just made the cut there on New Year's Eve, but it was before midnight, so it counts. So yeah, the two Clint Eastwood movies we watched was Gran Torino and this. And this movie I'd never seen. It does start a little slow, but it is a classic. Great score. Very wonderful score, including the Exhibition of Gold is one of the names of one of the compositions in the movie. Very iconic and historic. And again, if you go to film school, you'll probably see clips of this in any of your film history classes. And I know that I did. Especially this scene here is when they're facing off, uh, basically trying to find where this gold is buried in this graveyard. And there's a massive amount of gravestones. And they're trying to look for a particular gravestone where the gold is buried. And so... All these guys are kind of wanting the gold, so it's kind of like they're looking at each other, squaring off. They think they're going to all shoot each other, and who's going to get to the gold first is basically kind of the big question that the audience is asking themselves and wondering about. And that's what makes it so entertaining. So I'm super pumped about this movie. I think if you haven't seen it, then you should check it out, because I had waited too long. I should have seen this years and years ago. I'm a movie buff. Why hadn't I seen it? And I, I kind of like westerns quite a bit. However, I do need to watch a few more westerns. Everyone's commenting about how quiet the chat is. It is quite quiet, but that's okay. We, we can entertain ourselves, guys, and there's going to be a fun list of things to talk about. So I did tweet about the stream on Twitter, so who knows? People might join us in a little while. No biggie. Again, so one last time, this, this was my favorite movie I watched in 2020 that I had never seen before. The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, I give it my highest recommendation. Nails is joining us. Nails! There's nothing like Nails coming into a chat. It's like a ray of sunshine. We love Nails. Hey, Nails. All right. So let's go to our next category of the best of 2020 list. I'm going to give a shout out to favorite new show I watched in 2020 and that is Pen15 or Pen15 but I think it's pronounced Pen15. It is so wonderful guys. I have got to recommend it. I know I'm recommending everything basically on my list but uh, this is worth a watch. It's on Hulu, streaming on Hulu. There are two seasons out right now and again a lot of magazines and different entities declared this one of the best shows of 2020 and rightfully so season two came out in 2020 so this is something i actually watched in 2020 that was indeed released in 2020 so actually something from that particular year so not everything i watched was old <laughs> i did watch some current things at the time so yeah rolling stone as you can see buzzfeed entertainment weekly the new york times all calling it uh, like one of the best shows of the year for 2020 the washington post deadline variety vulture the atlantic indie wire and tv guide again it's a cringe comedy kind of i would describe it but it's got a ton of flipping heart i love 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 this show like it made me tear up sometimes with laughter and then sometimes with kind of emotion remembering kind of made me remember what it was like to be a preteen you know that confusing time in your life and I feel like this basically takes place in the early 2000 basically in the year 2000 they're in middle school and I can relate because I also was going into middle school not in 2000 I was in fifth grade in 2000 but uh yeah, well, almost in two. So in 2001, I was going into middle school and then going into high school in 2003, 2004. So yeah, I, around this time period, I was going through the same changes as these girls in the show are going through. And the weird thing is, so the two main characters in the show are played by 30-year-old women and the rest of the cast are played by like 13-year-olds, like legit 13-year-olds. So it's very authentic the other kids but the main characters they embody like the true essence of a preteen back in the 2000s and i i gotta say though if you haven't grown up in the 2000s if you didn't grow up and weren't a preteen during that time it doesn't matter i think this show will still be relatable relatable to you because again it's all about the awkwardness about growing up about changing not only you and your body and your personality but your friendships your relationships with your parents all kinds of really in-depth stuff so it's a comedy but it does take a look at that poignant other stuff you know psychology like basically psychological stuff that people are going through during this time in their life so a lot of heart 
I gotta say, it's a great show. I, I know I'm touting it a lot. But, uh, again, there's a lot of 2000 flair, like, or that decade, the beginning of the decade. If you guys remember, the clothes were crazy. The trends were crazy. Like, Lisa Frank was big. I know they talk about NSYNC Backstreet Boys. Here, they're talking about gel pens. And she's saying to her best friend, you are my actual rainbow gel pen. And so, yeah, a lot of awesome references, including, like, for me personally, by the way, I essentially lived on AOL Instant Messenger. So they are, there's literally like a whole episode about Instant Messenger. And then of course it's featured in many episodes after that. But like the two main characters, the two best friends, they are like fighting over who's going to like share the computer and they're trying to make their screen names and it's all ridiculous stuff. And oh my God, it's so great. I gotta, I gotta say you guys will love it. It's very, very heartfelt. And again, I watched season one and two of Pen15 in 2020, but season two was released in 2020 itself. So let me give you what some websites describe Pen15 like. So a particular site said, Pen15 is described as middle school as it really happened. The two actresses play versions of themselves as 13-year-old outcasts in the year 2000s. And so the two lead actresses are also the writers and creators behind Pen15. So it's a woman, or women, because it's two women, uh, driven show. And I love that. So it's very... I don't know. It's really awesome. It's very powerful. Very uh, heartfelt. It's got everything you could want in like a little comedy drama. But it's it's got a lot of cringe and funny stuff too though. So they are surrounded by actual 13 year olds where the best day of your life can turn into your worst with the stroke of a gel pen. And another description I found online says the comedic story of middle school seen through the eyes of two seventh grade girls dealing with the awkwardness of being a teenager. And there's a lot of crazy awkward stuff in it. Um, oh my God. And the, the clothing is so accurate. In fact, if you follow the show on Twitter, they talk a lot about how they picked out the wardrobe and how they went back and like started you know thrifting to find actual authentic stuff from the 2000s also some stuff i think they tried to replicate or recreate like the bathing suits there's this one uh, pool party episode where i think they recreated like 2000 era bathing suits so yeah uh very very good show i i, I mean I, i'm not overhyping it i swear to you it's good nails is noticing that i have changed my poster originally earlier in 2020 when i first started streaming like in november of 2020 it was a twin peaks poster back there then last stream i had a nightmare before christmas poster because you know it was christmas time or just wrapping up christmas time and then today there's a special reason why it's a ghostbusters print specifically the actor harold ramus who plays egon and he you know talks about his twinkie and how the psychic energy in the city is like a Twinkie that's like freaking huge, a huge Twinkie. Uh, and so it's a big famous scene and I love Harold Ramis. And of course he passed away a couple of years ago. Bill Murray even talked about it at that year's Oscars about how he missed his friend and stuff. So uh, we'll see why in a little while when I keep going through my best of 2020 list. Why is Harold Ramis on my wall? Well, there's a specific reason that ties into tonight's chat. So we'll see that soon enough. Literally, there's a wrestling-themed episode, by the way, because they discover, like, WWF at the time, WWE wrestling, and they're watching, like, Trish and Lita, and they're, like, wannabe wrestlers. They went through this phase in the show, and so they, they bully, not bully, but they basically kind of beg their way onto the school amateur wrestling team and it's oh my god absurdity ensues and of course one of the girls has a crush on one of the guys that's one of the main reasons why she wants to join the wrestling team so anyway a lot of fun stuff happens after they join the wrestling team and including walking down the hall like they own the hall and flipping one of the characters maya is wearing like a body flipping muscle shirt i don't i don't understand why but it's flipping ridiculous and incredible so nail says are they the age they are now playing themselves younger? Yes, basically, so these two women, these two actresses and producers, you could say, and writers, because they help create the show, they are 30 now. That's their actual age. They're, like, around my age. And so they're playing themselves, like, they kind of wrote their characters to be like how they were as they were 13. So they're playing themselves as 13. So, yeah, they're 30, but playing 13-year-olds. And, again, they're sharing the screen with real 13 year olds so they're the only 30 year olds on the show and the cool thing is so maya the one in the muscle shirt you see right here the white muscle shirt she is actually starring alongside her mother plays her mother 
in the show, which is really kind of neat. And um, she says, I, I read some backstage stuff. She said that she got, got annoyed with her mom during filming, just like she would. She felt like she was back in high school and the two creators joked like, God, we feel like we're back in high school right now. This is so weird. It's like a, a time warp type of thing. So again, very, very very good. I, I gotta say, you guys gotta check it out. The bathing suit episode with the pool party, they have two-piece bathing suits on. One's like a jean looking, like jean pattern, like, you know, you wear jeans, but it's like a bathing suit. And the other one, they're both two pieces, which is funny because one pieces were pretty big in the late 90s, early 2000s. But in this case, they were wearing two pieces and one of them was, like I said, jeans. And it's kind of just absurd. <laughs> All right, the runner-up for favorite show that I watched in 2020 was The Mandalorian because it's an amazing show, especially if you love Star Wars and the Star Wars universe. So good. I gotta say, I'm just into season two now. Like, Paul and I are watching it. Oh my god, it's so good. You thought that little, the child couldn't get any cuter, but in season two, oh my god, he gets even flipping cuter. All the little noises and squeaks he makes, oh, Oh my god, so adorable! I can't take it, it makes your mind blow up. Because that's how flippin' cute he is. And so sweet, uh, so adorable. So season one would definitely make my list for honorable mention for favorite new show I had watched in 2020. And yes, even though his name is technically not Baby Yoda, uh, he will always be Baby Yoda, basically. Yes, that's what Nails says, and I agree. Because he's so cute and he looks like Yoda, so Baby Yoda forever. Even though that's not his real name. That's okay. Uh, his real name's still cute, too. Alright. So, again, I can't say enough about those two shows. I think you should check out both if you haven't already. And, again, here's another cute picture of the child in his little bayonet basket thing where he floats around. Alright. Favorite documentary that I had never watched before. Uh, it's Diego Maradona, and of course, actually, he just passed away a few weeks ago, and this is from, this documentary is from 2019, and it has a lot of bonus features, so if you guys don't know who he is, he's a famous soccer player, and really crazy character, he played for this team for a couple of years, and basically won them a championship, but then they kind of wrote him off, and kind of cast him out and kind of looked down upon him afterwards later in life. And then later in life, he had a lot of problems, like addiction problems, and he gained a lot of weight and was really unhealthy. But I gotta say, this is a great look back. It's got insane amounts of footage that you would have never guessed existed. I'm not a big soccer fan, but this documentary really, really drug me in and enticed me. And even though I don't even... I do care about soccer now, to be honest, but at the time I watched this, I didn't care about soccer hardly at all, but Paul is a big soccer fan, that's why I watched it, so I gotta say, once I watched it, I was like, oh my god, this is a great documentary, all the footage when he was in his prime, that was like kind of off the field, behind the scenes footage, really stuff that you wouldn't believe even existed, and yeah, there's some controversy surrounding him throughout his life, and again, he did just pass away. I gotta recommend it if you're into soccer, and even if you're not into soccer, give it a watch, and who knows, you might actually like it. So again, the, the, the title, Diego Maradona, and the tagline, Rebel Hero, Hustler, God, because they did call him God you know, the team he played for, the people called him like a god. They worshipped him there. I can't even remember what team he played, of course. I watched this in the beginning of 2020, I will say. There's a whole bunch of controversy, Good Guy Dave, because he just got into drugs and he got into partying too much and he got into, he was almost like kind of tied to the mafia family in the city that he played for. And so, because he was involved with them, he... He got into a lot of trouble, and then I think he switched teams. Uh, also, also, there's a whole big thing. He played for the World Cup from his whole home country. It's all very uh, intricate, but the documentary explains it very well. Very sad story, but man, what a player. I gotta say, no matter what you think about the moment with him versus England and the controversial goal, you can't deny that he was an, a fantastic player. They show some of the footage of him playing. Oh my god, it just blows you away. And I'm sorry, Nails. I know this is a, a deep cut here, and I'm rubbing salt into your wound. I'm so sorry. But I gotta say, he was a fantastic player. I can't lie. Now I'm gonna talk about my favorite non-horror movie rewatches. And of course, as you can see on your screen, Ghostbusters is one. And I do want to say, okay, I want to preface this with, 
I said non-horror. And you might be thinking, wait, wait, wait. Ghostbusters is considered horror. No, guys. I actually don't consider Ghostbusters a horror movie. A lot of people do. And if you're wondering why I have my Harold Ramis up, it's because I am talking about Ghostbusters. So again, I'm talking about best rewatches of 2020. So movies that I went back and took another look at. Movies I might have seen one time. Movies I might have seen a hundred times, like Ghostbusters. So here, and I've got more than just Ghostbusters to talk about. Here's my list here. Again, I'm going to come back to my photos. We've got Ghostbusters. And then this is my favorite. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. And it's Bill Murray. Oh my god, Bill Murray. He's just a comedic genius. All right. And I told you guys we watched Gran Torino on New Year's Eve, so I'm counting it as one of my favorite non-horror movie rewatches of 2020, Gran Torino. So good. Clint Eastwood, you know, later in life, pulling off a fantastic performance. And man, it had a lot of heart. Very heartfelt, emotional ending. And whoo. I love it. And of course, there's a scene where he literally tells people to get off my lawn, but it's more like, <laughs> why am I making him sound crazy? Okay, it's more like, get off my lawn. I can't even do it. Uh, Paul can do it. And he's like, why do you make it sound so weird when he says that? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. All right, so that was one of the great movies I rewatched this year. And I had only seen it once in the theater. And I got to say, so I rewatched it, like I said, New Year's Eve with Paul. And we both said, wow, we don't remember how much we love this movie. It's probably now one of both of our favorite movies. So we have discovered it's a favorite of ours. And we had forgotten just how good It Flippin' was. It was honestly quite incredible. All right, so you guys know I can't go through a stream. Well, I can go through one or two streams, but hardly a stream where I don't mention this movie. So yes, one of my favorite rewatches of 2020, of course, has to be Free Willy. I have to give it a shout out. I have to say how much I love Free Willy. I, I just can't leave it off. I honestly can't. Um, it's such a feel-good movie. It's such a heartfelt movie. And man, the interaction between Jesse, the character Jesse, and the Will who is played by Keiko, an actual whale, who is late, later then let go. Again, you know, the fa the story behind the movie is even more fascinating than the movie itself, and I talk about it more than you could ever want to hear <laughs> about someone talk about Free Willy, but I did on my YouTube channel, so check it out. You guys know I gotta give you the Free Willy emote, which I am working on. All right, another great rewatch that I hadn't seen in a couple of years, quite a few years, but I happened to have seen this twice in the movie theater. I remember specifically I liked it so much that I went back and I saw it two times in the theater, and that is District 9. Very, very creepy, dystopian, sci-fi, almost you could call it a thriller. And you see, of course, Peter Jackson's name there. Don't be fooled, it's not directed by Peter Jackson, but he presented the movie. And they marketed this movie pretty well because you didn't really know exactly what it was about. It was shot very realistically and almost kind of like found footage style. But it's not a horror movie. It's just such a good sci-fi, awesome, uh, really cool movie. And the thing is, everyone's wondering, will there be a sequel? For years, people have been wanting a flippin' sequel to this movie, and I would love it. So the reason we watched it is because Paul and I were, you know, looking through movies, and I kind of wanted to rewatch this, and he had never seen it. And so we were doing, like, a sci-fi movie night, and one of the movies we had watched was Six, I think it was called The Sixth Day, and that's with Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he's, like, a clone, essentially. And, oh, my God, it's a bad movie. I thought it was so good. I remember loving that movie, but when we watched it with Paul, I was like, oh, my God, it's kind of bad, actually. So then the second movie we picked that night was this one, and he loved it. So it kind of rectified my bad pick for The Sixth Day, which I found out I don't like as much as I used to. But, oh, yes, it's such a good movie. And Cat Sand, she loves to. District 9, uh, really loved the main character. Yeah, the main character who's like morphing and transforming, uh, and I don't want to say too much, but oh my god, it's a uh, really, really uncomfortable what starts to happen to the main character, and you just feel for him and what's happening, and wow, what a cool story with a lot of layers of meaning, because you know, these creatures are kind of relegated to a certain area, and they're they're treated like second-rate citizens. They're, they're treated really terribly. So there's a lot of social commentary that's kind of hidden under a sci-fi theme, and I like that a lot. 
And Nail says not only was there supposed to be a sequel, but apparently there were supposed to be three, like three of the movies. That's really interesting. Of course, I would just be happy with at least a sequel because it's been years and it's still really, really good. It holds up. I just watched it, like I said, um, I think it was mid-2020 when we watched this and Paul saw it for the first time and he really, really enjoyed it. So that's a, that says a lot that, you know, it still holds up today because it was released quite a few years ago. You know, not too, too old, but, you know, I wouldn't say it's recent. All right, and then I can't ever omit this movie. I kind of watch it almost once a year or once every two years. Everyone always bashes this version of Batman, but it's Batman, The Dark Knight Rises, and I like it because I like Bane. I like Tom Hardy as Bane. Tom Hardy's one of my favorite actors. I think he really does an awesome job at being Bane. You know how hard it is to act with something covering the majority of your face? When you think of acting, they use so many of their, you know, their they use their mouth to do facial expressions. They use their mouth to uh, obviously speak very well. Well, basically, all Tom Hardy has is flipping his eyes to convey anything. And so to me, what a fantastic job he does with just his eyes and kind of upper face showing and nothing else to convey his emotions and feelings and or lack thereof, I should say, because he's a really, really great bad guy, as uh, Good Guy Dave is pointing out. And again, some people kind of bash this movie. A lot of people prefer the, you know, Heath Ledger, Joker, Batman movie. I prefer this one personally, and I could watch it time and time again. And I gotta say, uh, movie soundtracks, movie scores, this is one of my all-time favorite movie scores, is the score for... The Dark Knight Rises. It's so good, you could listen to it over and over again. And Kat says, yep, Tom Hardy is great. Yeah, he's great, and he loves animals, too. Especially dogs. <laughs> Nail says she likes Tom Hardy, and she's tired of movies putting his beautiful face in masks and, and prosthetics. Oh my god, I know the Capone movie. I watched that this year, too, which was also Tom Hardy playing, like, him as a really, really, really old man. And me and Paul kind of disagreed on that movie because he liked the Capone movie and I actually didn't like it because I thought it was super slow and very confusing because he was kind of losing his mind. And so some things you were seeing, he was kind of almost hallucinating and you didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And so, yeah, the Capone movie, man, he looked totally different. They made him look so old. Tom Hardy did a great job, though. Even though I didn't, like, love that movie, he did a good job. And again, Bane, it's probably one of my favorite bad guys of all time in terms of this movie version of Bane. Of course, if you are familiar with the comics or with Batman the Animated Series, Bane is totally different looking than this. It's not like this at all, so very different. And Kat says she has not seen this Batman Oh my gosh, I don't know if you haven't seen the third one, Cat, or if you haven't seen any of the Batman trilogy done by Christopher Nolan, but the Nolan Batmans are very good, very different, kind of almost realistic take on Batman, you know, more so than, let's say, Tim Burton. <laughs> okay, so Tim Burton, by the way, did a whole bunch of Batman movies, he did Batman movies too. Uh, including just Batman, and to me that's more cartoonish, whereas Christopher Nolan does the more serious, the more realistic version of Batman. And I think both are great, though, because both have very different elements to them, and both can stand on their own, obviously. And I love different takes of things and different interpretations, and each set of films definitely are very very different. Watership Down, the animated movie that gave lots of 90s kids nightmares because it's not a kid's movie, but a lot of kids wound up watching this movie in the 90s because, you know, it looked like it was an animated family film. No. Very disturbing. Yes, as uh, Josh is saying, very absolutely disturbing. Yes. You know, Paul was watching the movie with me, kind of not fully. He was watching football on the computer, and I was watching this DVD in 2020. I was re-watching Watership Down on the, on the TV. And so he kept looking up and getting distracted by me watching Watership Down. And he was like, how did you watch this movie as a kid? Like, what is wrong with your parents for letting you watch this movie? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean... It's realistic, it's about life and death, and the cool thing is, it's, yes, it's violent, it's got a lot of blood, as you can see on your screen, there's, like, this evil master bunny guy, and, uh, there's also, like, a dog that comes and rips bunnies apart, and there's blood everywhere, and there's bunnies suffocating, so lots of scarring stuff that you'd be, like, disturbed by if you were a kid, and oh my god, yes, Nails just says, bright eyes burning like fire, anyway, there's a big song about... Uh, it's called Bright Eyes that they put in the movie. And uh, actually, 
I remember I watched some bonus features when I watched Watership Down in 2020, and they were talking about how they just threw that in the movie, and it did really well, and maybe they shouldn't have put it in, but it, it wound up being really good. So yeah, bright eyes. <laughs> like, you don't want to hear me sing it. It's bad. Oh my god. Nails is saying I'm killing her tonight. But yeah, oh my god, I know it's creepy. It gives, it gives Nails nightmares, she says. And dogs aren't dangerous, I know. But this dog apparently was like a hunting dog or something. I don't know. It's pretty crazy how this dog goes insane. But the whole story, I will say, to, to answer Paul's question, the reason I was allowed to watch this is because, one, my mom... Not my mom. My mom would have hated this. My dad loved animation and loves animation still to this day. And he watches a lot of cartoons. But I'm not even sure if he knew right away what this movie was and if it was okay. But I know that, like, he definitely had to have watched it with me and was okay with us owning it on VHS. So, yeah, I think it's a really good story about life and death and, you know, the life cycle of people and passing on and uh, finding a home and community and I don't know. I just think kids can handle a lot more than people give them credit for because this is just about stuff that you're going to have to face in life. So to me, if you could handle this movie as a kid, you're set up pretty well for handling life, I think, because there's a lot of bad and negative and scary stuff in life. And that's what this movie kind of presents that, you know, it is the way of the world, you know, uh, sometimes you got to deal with obstacles. And that's what the bunnies had to deal with in this movie is they had to deal with being hunted and finding a new home and all the dangers of being a rabbit. So yeah, of course, there's analogies there about, you know, society, that the bunnies represent kind of people in a way. But yeah, you could go on and on about this movie, but in terms of animation history, it's very important. In fact, Guillermo del Toro, the director, he has talked about this movie as being, like, very, very influential in terms of in terms of animation history. And there's some messy stuff, like, there's a whole bonus feature of Guillermo talking about Watership Down and what it means for animation and how, you know, if you look at some scenes and sequences, it's a little messy. It's not completely as animators would call it clean. It's not clean animation. There's some things like some, it's called cycling when they reuse the same, like, uh, I guess you could call it animation, the same sequence. They kind of loop it and it's called like a cycle, uh, which Disney a lot of times avoids doing cycling, or at least in like their classic movies w with their original animators, they didn't do a lot of cycling and they did a lot of intricate backgrounding. Watership Down had some cycling, but it also had some really beautiful, intense animation. And of course, I don't know, like they had some awesome backgrounds and basically like, almost like paintings. The backgrounds are like paintings. They're beautiful. So anyway, Guillermo goes on and on on the bonus feature on this Blu-ray edition of Watership Down, talking about how important this movie is and historic at the time. So again, he loves it, and he's an animation buff. Who knew that the director, Guillermo del Toro, is an animation buff? But yeah, he loves animation, and um, you could buy the Blu-ray and listen to his talk to find out why he loves this movie so much. He just describes it so eloquently. I couldn't do it justice explaining why he likes it so much, but uh, he does a great job in kind of conveying why it's so good and why we should remember it forever as an important part of animation history. So again... Yes, Watership Down, one of my favorite rewatches of 2020. And another favorite rewatch, The Untouchables. So, you know, you guys, uh, Sean Connery died in 2020. Huge loss. So when we found that out, me and Paul, we decided to have like a mini... It wasn't really a marathon because we only watched two movies. We watched The Untouchables and I think um, Murder on the Orient Express, I think it was. And he has a very small part on that. But, of course, in The Untouchables, he's got a very big part. And I had seen this years and years ago. But, man, rewatching it again, it is so good. Of course, if you guys remember, the famous scene from that movie is a baby carriage going down some steps. Very famous scene. Very Done very well. Very kind of has you on the edge of your seat. Lots of emotion for you, the audience member, watching it play out in slow motion, it feels like. So, yeah. Sean Connery in that movie is really good. And Claus, a.k.a. Good Guy Dave, is asking me, what is my favorite Sean Connery movie? There's a lot of great Connery movies. Of course, he was a 007. So those are pretty historic, but I gotta admit, I haven't watched a lot of James Bond movies. So, uh, in terms of favorite Sean Connery movie for me, gosh, it's a hard one. You know, I know this is a weird pick, but I really like Finding Forrester, especially because, if you guys remember, uh, that line where he says, You're the man now, dog! So he says that, and it became a whole website. So there's a website called YTMND.com, which would do a lot of, like, GIFs and looping 
I don't even know what you would call them. It was almost like memes before memes were popular and like looping gifs that were like absurd and funny. And that was a big one on the site. And it was what the site was named after. You're the man now dog. Y-T-M-N-D. Uh, which is the initials for you're the man. The abbreviation for you're the man now dog. But anyway, I always think of that movie. You're the man now dog. And like his cool little accent. But I haven't seen it in years. But I gotta say, I love that movie. And I tried to to persuade Paul into watching it or rewatching it with me in 2020 and he's like it sounds boring I'm like no it's good though damn it like you know it's good I, I don't know why and Kat mentions another great movie with him in it that I also really like Ex Extraordinary Gentleman that was an awesome movie lots of historical figures in the movie really cool and like l I don't know lots of cool characters in that movie uh, and lots of uh, kind of fictional characters as well in the movie it was great it was a very clever premise, and it's been years since I saw that. Lots of twists and turns in that movie, too. So, yeah, I gotta watch more James Bond, though. That's what we're gonna learn here. Uh, maybe in 2022, when things die down, when I don't have so many flubbing marathons already planned. Nail says, if you go back to the Sean Connery pick, Rob said the building to the left is Duncan's toy chest from Home Alone 2? Oh my god, I had no idea! So the building on the left... Oh my god, that's so cool! How does he know that, Nails? How does Rob know? Was that, like, on a bonus feature of something? Or, like, a behind-the-scenes of the Untouchables or something? So it says in this wiki link that Nails so kindly sent to me, the Rookery Building was featured in the film Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, in which the exterior and one of the lower levels were modeled as the toy store Duncan's Toy Chest. The Rookery was also used by Frank Norris in his novel The Pit. Well, that's really cool. And the Rookery was featured prominently in the 1987 film The Untouchables as the police headquarters of Elliot Ness. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Thanks for telling me that, uh, Nails. So, so fascinating. So again, that, that info is from the Wikipedia page. And uh, I guess she looked up the Rookery builder, Building, which is the official name of the building. As you can see it, guys, it's, uh, Nails says it's on the left of this picture here from The Untouchables. Now let's get to the cutest thing I watched in 2020. So you guys might have some guesses. I don't know. What is the cutest thing I watched? Dun, 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 dun. I'm excited for you guys to see this because it's a show that not many people know about. Here it is. The cutest thing I watched in 2020, it was not The Mandalorian with Baby Yoda. No, almost nails. Very close second, Baby Yoda. But this show is called Grizzy and the Lemmings, and now all the episodes are available on Netflix. For a while, only season one was on Netflix. Now both seasons are on. Paul and I watched all of them, and I think it was over 100 episodes, because I think each season 78 episodes. So, this is really exciting uh, show. It's so funny. Like, look at these little blue creatures. So those are called the Lemmings. And the Grizzly Bear, they're constantly kind of uh, at odds with each other. And every episode has, like, a formula where, you know, the bear tries to outwit and get the Lemmings out of the cabin he's, like, kind of using to relax in, the camper's cabin. Uh, and the Lemmings are trying to use the cabin for relaxation and fun and, like, going crazy. And so they're always kind of at odds with each other. And every episode ends with them going down the highway, like, in different ways. And it's, oh, it's so good, guys. Oh, my gosh, it's so good. Uh, you guys need to watch this. You need to watch this, okay? It is the cutest thing ever. And all the Lemmings say is, to booty. To booty! I can't even do it. I can't even do it justice. To booty! To booty! So me and Paul, we would watch it, and here they are. They're so cute. They're like, they love to dance. They love to, like, hop up and down. They love to play, and yeah, these are little lemmings, and they always say tabooty. Uh, oh my god, they're so adorable. Paul and I, for a long time, would just say tabooty to each other, like, tabooty, tabooty. Yeah, <laughs> we just love it. Anyway, it's the cutest thing ever. Here's another cute flipping picture of them. Uh, I love them. As you can see, they're flipping the cutest things in the entire world. So yeah, they get the cute award for 2020, and I've got more pictures of them because they're just that darn cute. Here's them doing a little dance, and there's a goofy one, but, so they're goofy, but m majority of the time, I couldn't get a lot of super cute ones of them, but I am telling you, as many goofy things as they have, they have just as many flipping cute-ass things. Pardon my French. I'm very passionate about uh, the lemmings. And here's another, where he's all in a big puff, and there's the grizzy. Oh my god. Oh, they're so flipping awesome. 
again, there's so many episodes, and they're like seven minutes each, so really quick watches, something great for the end of the night, and that's how me and Paul watched it, so throughout 2020, we, w- we would cap off the night with watching Grizzly and the Lemmings, and sometimes we would watch one, sometimes we would watch like five, because again, they're like seven minutes long, and yeah, it's kind of like in a kawaii style, like a Japanese type of style, uh, so cute, I think it's from Canada, and they always like this stuff that looks like Nutella, uh, that they always fight over, oh my god, it's so cute and uh very creative actually so they uh try to put the grizzly to sleep so there's them singing him to sleep and they're going tabudi 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 and then grizzly's going to sleep so you can see they're dressed as sheep counting sheep type of thing oh my god they're so cute you've got to watch this guys you're gonna love it and you're gonna be like thank you for telling me kelsey Uh, trust me favorite no thinking necessary watch for 2020 was impractical jokers dinner party and i gotta say i love the impractical jokers the regular show it's one of my favorite most fun just relaxing things you could watch like 20 episodes in a row and like it's the best day if you just watch 20 or 30 in a row because they're always playing it on true tv and just to back up to the lemmings you can find grizzly and the lemmings on netflix all of it's on netflix and also i think we also watched it on youtube tv because they were playing it on youtube tv for a while like on a specific channel but yes netflix but back to impractical jokers such a good show um so funny they had to do something with the pandemic so what they started to do was like a zoom call or a Skype call, all from their own houses where they're eating dinner and having like a party and making jokes and talking, and I love them. Here's the guys, as you can see on your screen. There's Q, Sal, Murr, I'm not saying that in order, and Joe. So in order, if you're looking from left to right, it is Q, uh, Joe, Murr, and Sal. It's weird saying it in that order, because it's like they're never in that order. Anyway, Sal is my favorite, Murr's a close second, Paul's favorite is Q. He's actually my least favorite. No, no, Joe's my least favorite. Because he never... Joe uh, Joe is the easiest in terms of if he gets punished on the regular Joker's show where they do punishments and stuff and, and pranks. If he ever gets punished, he's the hardest to actually make feel embarrassed or do something that he doesn't like. He's, like, never bashful. So, to me, Joe is the hardest person to punish. So, to me, like, the episodes where he loses are the worst because it's just not that bad of a punishment because he has no shame. He doesn't care. Whereas Sal, oh my god, Sal's the best to be punished. And I saw Sal and uh, Q on Chris Jericho's cruise. It was a wrestling cruise. And it was a lot of fun, but it was also kind of stressful because I was away from home. But my favorite thing from the wrestling cruise wasn't wrestling, but the Impractical Jokers, Q and and Sal were the only ones there. But they did a whole little thing. They did some funny improv. They were there. And they did some stuff about wrestling. Oh, they were so fun. They're, They're wrestling fans, so yeah, I love them. Kat says Andrew, her son, and her enjoy Impractical Jokers. They were supposed to see them live back in August. Unfortunately, the pandemic canceled it. Oh my god, Kat, that's so funny. Paul got me tickets for Christmas last year to see them in August too. So I would have been probably at the same show if you were going to come to New Orleans to see them. They usually perform at the Sanger or like Mahalia Jackson sometimes. But anyway, I've already seen them live. If you count the cruise, I think it's four or five times. If you don't count the cruise, it's one less. But yeah, I... I love them. But their dinner party this year for 2020, they made the most of a bad situation and they still churned out a funny show. So if you guys like the Jokers, the regular show, check out their dinner party show. You know, I'm sure they have it on demand somewhere. And anyway, True TV is always playing replays. Murr is Kat's favorite. Oh my god, Murr is is my second favorite. He is so funny. So you and me, Kat, you, me, and Andrew and Paul would have been at the same show because, yeah, I, um, oh yeah, it was at the Smoothie King. It was a bigger venue for them because, yeah, I saw them, uh, two or three times at the Sanger. I saw them once on the cruise. So, yeah, three times at the Sanger, once on the cruise, so four times, and this would have been my fifth time seeing them, but it got canceled. That was my Christmas present last year. Not in 2020, but in 2019. Oh, And I was all sad. So I wish I could have seen them. But next time, they always come to New Orleans. Probably because they like to drink. And I know they did a special here once too. But anyway, this is my favorite non-thinking necessary rewatch of 2020. Not rewatch, I'm sorry, watch. Something you could just throw on. You don't have to think. You just can be really excited and chill and relax and and laugh. So my best or favorite music-themed movie I watched in 2020, which is a recent movie, but it's not from 2020. I think it's from 2019. It's Rocket Man, of course, Elton John. It's like the Elton John 
kind of like biopic semi-biopic it's half musical that's kind of like a musical because he sang all the characters sang on camera and they like they featured all of his songs in the movie so that was a great musical well movie musical kind of kind of it was more like a biopic but rocket man if you like Elton John or just like music in general, I think you will really like this movie. And it had a lot of heart too, I gotta say. Oh, my bangs. What is wrong with them? Anyway, it had a lot of heart and it's a good movie. We also watched Bohemian Rhapsody. Rhapsody. Blah, 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 blah. Can't speak. You guys know what I'm trying to say. The Queen movie, the Freddie Mercury movie this year too. But to me, I didn't like it nearly as much as Rocket Man. To me, uh, you know, Freddie Mercury, it was the same actor who plays in, uh, that robot show what is it called i know i know i saw a good guy dave watches it anyway um the same actor played freddie mercury as is in that tv show and this bang is wrong with me okay let's start over <laughs> sorry so the same actor played freddie mercury and i didn't like i mean i liked his portrayal but like i kept feeling like i knew it wasn't freddie mercury like i could tell it was the actor yeah, Mr. Robot. So yeah, I could tell it was the actor from Mr. Robot and not Freddie Mercury, so that like took it out of it for me. Whereas Rocket Man, I wasn't that concentrated on the actor playing Elton John, and I thought he looked a lot like him, so I thought that was a good, really good casting decision. But yeah, both were great though, overall. But, yeah, my favorite out of the two, Rocket Man, for sure. And now we come to, I'm really excited about this. Okay. My favorite TV show rewatch in 2020. And just to put it in perspective, the things I watched. So I rewatched uh, Parks and Rec because Paul had never seen it. But I can't really completely count it as a rewatch because I had watched almost all of Parks and Rec years ago. But I had never finished the final season. I was like four episodes away from finishing. So I can't count it as an official rewatch because I still had four episodes that I had never seen. So it was half rewatch, half new watch in a way. So I can't name Parks and Rec as my favorite rewatch of a TV show in 2020. But what I can name as my favorite rewatch, and Kat might know the answer here, dun, 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 dun. that's my drum roll, which is not a drum roll at all. But my favorite TV show rewatch, The Office. And you guys might have guessed why. The Office is, what or not is it was leaving netflix because now it's left and it was going to peacock so i wanted to watch it in case i didn't get peacock the paid version of peacock i wanted to watch it before it left netflix and paul had never seen it so we had just watched parks and rec first which to me is a way more in your face funny show it's it's more i feel like if someone casually likes uh, the Office, they'll love Parks and Rec. Because Parks and Rec, I think, is just more in-your-face funny, whereas The Office is more subtle funny, but there's a lot of in-your-face stuff for The Office, too. So they're very similar types of shows. So yeah, I just enjoyed rewatching The Office so much. But Paul had never seen it. He saw Parks and Rec first, loved it. Then we watched The Office, and first he didn't like it. So here's what I have to say about The Office. Uh, the, it was Paul's first time watching it. It was awesome to see him experience it for the first time, like I was watching it through his eyes, kind of. But I was so worried in the beginning because I could just tell he wasn't laughing. Season one of The Office, I will say, is a little bit rocky. It's not for everybody. Um, in fact, Paul had watched an episode or two years ago and didn't like it. Because he heard everyone say, oh, you should watch it, you should watch it. But then he didn't like it when he watched it. So he had to give it like at least two seasons. And mid-second season, he started to like it. So anyway, yes, it took him a little while to warm up, but finally, he ended up loving the show. I think his favorite character was Dwight and Jim. He liked a lot, too. But somehow, this is the part that I hate, somehow after watching the entire show, he still doesn't like the character of Michael Scott. He loathes Michael Scott. And so that's my reaction there of him not liking Michael. It's Michael giving a mad look and that's for paul because yeah he still doesn't like michael scott how how and guys don't forget in the future i am doing a office versus parks and rec either or stream and oh it's <laughs> nail says that stream that future stream has got to go it can't happen there's a stream that will break up friendships like people will totally just become enemies i mean they'll hate each other uh which is not true of course but yeah it's a passionate subject because people have their favorites do you like parks and rec better or do you like the office better and again i'm not gonna say which one i like better i'm only picking the office right now as my favorite rewatch because technically i cannot consider 
Parks and Rec a rewatch as I hadn't seen the last four or five episodes. So yeah, I gotta say I'm not giving you guys any hints as to which I would pick as a favorite. You'll have to tune into that future stream and see. I love both so much and having watched the majority of both, the entirety of both in 2020, it's even harder to pick because watching them back to back, you just realize how great both shows are. And here's another Michael moment. Sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it is going. I just hope I find it along the way. And that's kind of like me. I feel like I'm Michael Scott sometimes uh, in a way. Not all the time. Uh, I don't ever say that's what she said too much. But yeah, I uh, I love The Office. I love Michael Scott. I can't believe Paul doesn't. I'm I'm appalled he doesn't like Michael Scott, but some people don't, you know, yes, he is a bad guy, he is, uh, kind of a jarring personality at first, I say bad, he's not bad, but, you know, he's, uh, he's very, uh, ignorant, I would say, ignorant is a good description of Michael Scott, but he has a huge heart, and I think that's why you gotta love Michael Scott, I mean, when he goes to Pam's art show, and he's, like, the only one there to support her, and she's so happy he's there, then he buys her art, and he loves it, and yeah, I gotta say, oh, I, I just, I love that episode, it's just, it's why you should love Michael, that particular episode in Onward, The Office is great, I don't care what Paul says, even though he loved it, you gotta love Michael Scott, whatever, we'll agree to disagree. That's neither here nor there. But oh my gosh, I would love to do a future stream. It doesn't have to be in 2021. <laughs> I'm forgetting the year again. It doesn't have to be in 2021, but I'd love to do a future stream with Kat, who is rewatching The Office right now with her son. Um, I re have rewatched it like five times total. P Parks and Rec, obviously, I've rewatched it one and a half times. Because uh, I watched it all once except for four episodes, and then I watched the whole thing again. So two times, or one and a half, however you want to say it. So I've seen The Office more, and that's because I just was an Office fan first. I knew about The Office before, and it's an older show, of course, uh, than Parks and Rec is. But both are really wonderful shows, and I cannot wait to choose between them. Or should I say, I, I, I am dreading choosing between them because it will be very, very difficult. But yes, Kat and I, one day, I would love to talk about The Office. Shows I watched in 2020 that I wish were not canceled, but they have been canceled. So two shows that were really good that I'm bummed about literally never going to come back. Emergence, which was this great, great show with the, uh, it's like a cop. It was like the cop from the first season of Fargo, the woman cop. I think she was in Fargo. She was also in another show. What the? Oh, she was in um Krampus, the movie Krampus. The sister to the main character, Tony Collette's sister in the movie was in emergence it was her she was playing a cop she was taking care of a little girl who had powers and again it got canceled after season one bummer it was really good me and paul watched the whole thing we loved it and another show next n-e-x-t but i think it had a capital x and that was all about a, an official an artificial intelligence computer taking over becoming really smart and endangering the world especially endangering the United States. And it had the guy, the the white-haired guy from Mad Men. And yeah, by the way, guys, look at my shirt. It's Heisenberg. Anyway, that was a really great show. And we just watched it. We finished it in December next. And it was canceled. So bummer. Both shows should have kept going. So yeah, I'm really sad to see those shows not come back. But uh, those are the shows I wish could continue. But they're not going to. No! It is what it is. Okay, so... Moving on to the next category, Biggest Guilty Pleasure Watch of 2020. This is kind of a typical answer. So I gotta say, the Biggest Guilty Pleasure Watch, I think is everybody's, or most people's, Guilty Pleasure Watch, Tiger King. Me and Paul were like, this is so crazy, how could this get crazier as we're watching it and binging it in the beginning of the year, right in the beginning of the pandemic and everything. Uh, we were like, this is so crazy, like, how is this real? Uh, we were just amazed by... Tiger King. So yeah, that's my biggest guilty pleasure watch because it's obviously kind of trashy people, but it's kind of addicting to watch the show. So I gotta say, yeah, that was kind of one of my guilty pleasures of 2020. It is what it is. Nail says she was sad that Mindhunter was canceled. I've actually never seen that, but that's a bummer that's canceled. Sorry about that, Nails. I hate when a good show that you like is canceled. It makes you bummed. It's like, no! Why didn't other people like it? Like, you know, if you look back at some of the great canceled shows of the 90s, Freaks and Geeks comes to mind right away. One season and it's gone? Come on. It was so good. And then My So-Called Life, also canceled after one season with a cliffhanger. Come on. No! I say come on a lot, too. You know how I say ridiculous all the time? I also say come on. 
Uh, Paul always mocks me saying, come, he's like, come on. And he says, I say it with an accent, but whatever. <laughs> I, I always argue, I do not have an accent, but whatevs. He says I do. All right, let's go to my recommendations. So out of the things I watched in 2020, it's not necessarily stuff from 2020, but just stuff I happened to watch or rewatch in 2020. Uh, here, actually, this is new watches. So here are the things that I recommend for you guys to check out if you haven't seen it. Stuff that I watched in 2020. Picard is something that I recommend you guys check out that I watched in 2020. Season 1 was awesome. Better than I could have ever hoped for. Uh, it just... This, for a Star Trek fan, uh, specifically, I'm a TNG fan, a Next Generation fan. For somebody who grew up loving the Next Generation with my dad, uh, to see them go back to my favorite captain, Captain Picard, to revisit that character and to have some other characters make cameos, it really warmed my heart. It was like a dream come true, something that I had wanted to see for many years. But as you guys know, nostalgia could be a tricky thing. It could either be well done, something that's a remake or a reboot, or like a something that is a continuation like in Picard's case it could either be good or it can bank on its nostalgia and kind of be trashy and bad and not as good as you wished it was so to me this lived up to expectations of oh I love Captain Picard how is this going to turn out and yeah to me Captain Picard is the best captain I like him so much more than Captain Kirk and any other captain it's just Picard is so uh you know he doesn't he has a little smirky smarmy sense of humor but he's really not very funny he's more serious but he's very eloquent I think is the best word to describe him and a great leader uh, and a great stand-up guy has a great set of morals and I don't know I just love him so much you know at first they were all worried that Picard in the beginning of TNG that he was going to be too kind of high and mighty too pompous you know but eventually I think you just become really used to his personality and more of his emotions come out and he becomes more human to us and a little more relatable as the seasons go and you, you start to love him and you really relate to him because of course being a captain being a leader and responsible for so many lives is hard so anyway I love Picard I think it did the character of Captain Picard justice I think it did TNG justice I think it carried on the legacy quite well and I know that they're in the middle of a Discovery, new Discovery episodes right now. I have not caught up with that, so I'm not up to date on Discovery. However, I loved Picard. That's what I could say on that. I do suggest it if you like Star Trek. If you guys remember the movie, the TNG movie, First Contact, that was one of my favorite movies growing up. I, I believe I saw it in the theater, and yeah, it was... We had it on VHS, and I had, like, nightmares about the Borg. So to me, I loved, loved First Contact as a kid. And then I went back, of course as like a preteen and watched TNG on uh, DVD. So I watched it all. And of course on TV I watched it with my dad. But yes, Picard rules. Make it so. Let's continue with our list. <laughs> so the other things that I recommend you guys check out, Better Call Saul. Oh, such a good show. And I will say this past year in 2020, the last season of Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, oh my God, it was so good. He, at the end for the season finale, he blew up a huge number like I guess you could call it not a statue I don't even know what you would call that he, he blew up a big 2020 and he said f you 2020 and he blew it up John Oliver what a great way to get some poignant commentary about what's going on in the world and in America but also with a lot of humor and with some definite cheekiness. I love John Oliver. So this show I was never really into before because I never really watched it or took the time to get into it. But man, this last season of Last Week Tonight blew me away. Paul got me into it. He's been watching it for years. I gotta admit, it's my first time watching like almost an entire season of it. I'd never really watched it before, but man, I'm in love with it. And I love, love, love John Oliver now. Um, I'm obsessed with him, kind of. Here we go to another... Uh, thing that I suggest. It's a documentary called The Orange Years, and it's about 90s Nickelodeon, and you could rent it on uh, Amazon for, for sure. I'm sure you could find it other places too, but I rented it on Amazon. It concentrates more on live action, I find, than the animation, but still good nonetheless. Here's another poster. Again, this is the story of 90s Nickelodeon. They have a lot of actors and actresses from the 90s shows from Nickelodeon, 
And it also has, like, people like Mark Summers. It's got Geraldine Laybourne, who's the president, or was the president of 90s Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon in the 90s. She was a huge influential person there. Uh, she's a huge part of why Nickelodeon turned out the way it turned out in the 90s and was so successful. And really, it became the biggest kids' network of all time. And it's still a powerhouse today because of its meteoric rise in the 90s. So again, you guys, if you love 90s Nickelodeon or Nickelodeon in general, check out the Orange Years. It's important to look back and to find out how they got to where they are today. And really, it's just cool to look back on your favorite shows from back when you were growing up as a kid, if you're a 90s kid like me. So some other things that I don't have pictures of. Solar Opposites, which is a great animated show. I think it's the same creators of Rick and Morty, which I've never watched, but Solar Opposites is on Hulu, and it's really funny. It's got some nerdy references, uh, very smart, too. But yes, kind of um, a little extreme and vulgar, but good, but really good. So yeah, I, I love Solar Opposites. I would definitely suggest that. The Disney documentary, I'm going to come back on camera because I don't have pictures for these. I would recommend the Disney documentary, Born in China, and it, it focuses on a couple of different animals, but... Uh, it focuses a large part on a baby panda and its mom. And because Paul loved pandas, we really had a good time watching Born in China. Again, you could find that on Disney+. Plus. Uh, very, very good documentary. It does have a bit of a sad twist to it, I gotta say. So, it's not all happy. I do have to warn you on that. But I love nature documentaries and nature TV shows. You know, like I loved back when I watched it, Blue Planet and uh, all, you know, life and all all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, we just watched David Attenborough's documentary that he just released this year on Netflix. That was good, too. You know, it really makes you think about global warming and stuff like that. And, like, we've got to take care of the Earth. You know, we really got to take care of our planet. So, yeah, Born in China, got to recommend it. Castle Rock Season 2. If you guys are familiar, it's a show on Hulu. I believe it's Hulu. But, yeah, Castle Rock Season 2. I got to say, it's a 100 times better. I like Season 1, but it was a little confusing. And season one had Bill Skarsgård in it. Season two was really good because it was kind of like the story um, from Misery a little bit. It, it had like Misery elements in it. Oh my god, it was so good. So yeah, I gotta recommend Castle Rock season two. I personally liked it better than season one, but I've liked both seasons in general. But yeah, season two is where it's at. Alright, also the movie Run was really good. It had the same actress as, uh, I can't remember her name, but she stars in American Horror Story. Very, very good. And yes, to back up, Castle Rock is on Hulu. I gotta recommend it. You guys would love it if you haven't seen it. Season 2 did a good job. Even better than the first. Yeah, it followed up really well. So yeah, the movie Run was really good. I just saw that. The Last Dance, of course, Michael Jordan documentary. Very, very informative. And if you like sports or basketball, of course, why not watch it? Even if you don't, Michael Jordan is a huge historic figure from the 90s in pop culture history. You know, take some time watch the last dance great behind the scenes footage great footage that you've never seen before of michael jordan his teammates oh my god so good and finally the movie once upon a uh, once upon a time in hollywood so good such a twist on uh, a story like a, a historical event a twist on it like it didn't happen the way they showed it in the movie they kind of i, I don't want to give it away so i'm not going to give anything away Favorite horror movie that I watched in 2020 that I had never seen before. Phantasm 2! Okay, Phantasm 2. So great. As you can see, he has a chainsaw. There was a chainsaw flipping battle. Can you believe it? There was a chainsaw battle. And not only because of that, there's a lot of other absurd things in, in the show. And so that's why I recommend it because a lot of crazy stuff happened. And yeah, such a funny movie, so ridiculous. Oh, I said ridiculous again. Gosh darn it, I thought I wasn't going to say it. Whatever. Alright, so now we move on to horror movies. Because as you guys know, I watched over 65, really, because I watched horror movies for Christmas too. I actually watched like 70-something horror movies this year. Or last year. Sorry, it's not 2020 anymore. <laughs> so, horror movies that I watched this year that I recommend. The Invisible Man, which wasn't part of my Halloween marathon. We just watched it randomly. It was really good. A nice twist on the whole Invisible Man idea. Midsommar. Here's a shot from Midsommar. Really weird, really disturbing. Everyone's screaming because I said ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, Midsommar. Oh my god, disturbing. 
I don't know what else to say besides disturbing. It was really, uh, I, I don't know. I was really creeped out by it. All right, this is going to make uh, Cat laugh in a little while. I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I get to it. So, other movies I recommend, Rare Exports. I watched it for Christmas, Clown House, The Final Girls, The Mortuary Collection, and here it is. Christmas Evil. Yes, Cat, I recommend it. I'm sorry, Cat didn't like it. I did like it. Check out our Christmas horror chat on my YouTube channel, Super Kicking It with Kelsey, K E L S I, to check out why I liked Christmas Evil and why Cat did not like it. Here is him as Santa Claus being really creepy in the movie. And yes, it was. it's on my list that I recommend. Cat would not recommend it, but it's okay. We can agree to disagree. And here is another scene from Christmas Evil. There he is at a party, looking all shell-shocked, and I think that's the actor I said was Hector Salamanca from Breaking Bad right there. You see him? That's him a little bit younger, I believe. That's him. So, yeah, isn't that crazy, guys? And Kat's like, no, why are you recommending this? But I am. Sorry, Kat, I gotta recommend it. All right, it, it is what it is. More movies I recommend that you guys check out horror movies, specifically Black Christmas from 1974, A Christmas Horror Story, Hellfest, the Serpent and the Rainbow, a Wes Craven film that's not very well known, but it is good. Train to Busan and The Blob from 1988. All great stuff. A lot of that I had never seen, but I recommend it. Okay. Best horror movie rewatches. The Conjuring. Oh, so good. Uh, the Fog, Hellraiser, Paranormal Activity, The Descent, and I loved this rewatch this year. Candyman. Be my victim. Be my victim. It's more like a whisper. All right, I loved that movie. That was a lot of fun. And I think that's my last picture. Yep. I also enjoyed rewatching Krampus, The Lost Boys, and Happy Birthday to Me. Great horror movies. I would suggest you guys check them out. All right, here's least favorites. Least favorite movie I watched in 2020. Gretel and Hansel. Oh my god, it looked so artsy, but it was terrible. Boring, 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 boring. And I couldn't follow the story. It was weird. I didn't like it at all. So yeah, not my cup of tea. So that is worst movie I watched in 2020. And it's a new movie, so it's kind of new. And finally, most disappointing TV show I watched in 2020. So I like this show called The Sinner. And it's been great. Season 1 was awesome. Season 2 was different, but really good. Season 3. I know someone, Kristen Ashley, she loved it. I saw her tweet about it. I was like, how could she be watching the same show as me? I hated it. Uh, me and Paul both were disappointed with Season 3 of The Sinner. Season 1 and 2, we loved. We watched it all. But Season 3 was weird. We kept waiting for something to happen. It was just really frustrating. And I hated the way it ended. Cable TV show. I can't remember what channel, if, if it's FX. But yeah. Uh, it might be USA. Actually, yeah, it's USA, I think. I believe. I think so. Anyway, season three, not a very good season. If you're going to check it out, check out season one and two. Yeah, Nail said she loved season one and then she was over it. Yeah, season two's good, but yeah, season three really went really downhill. I was like, come on. And it's funny, Nail's also turned off Han uh, Gretel and Hansel as well. Again, you're used to saying Hansel and Gretel. It was Gretel and Hansel. And yeah, it was artsy, but... I didn't like it. Oh, I didn't like it at all. So those were the worst picks for 2020. So no cat. Least favorite movie was not Christmas Evil. I liked Christmas Evil. Least favorite movie was definitely Gretel and Hansel. Ugh. And yes, Good Guy Dave is right. The Sinner is on USA Network. And yeah, season three is not where it's at. All right. We're going to cap off this discussion quickly with talking about my favorite books I read in 2020. Okay. So actually, I'm going to start in a reverse order. Okay. First off, we've got Nosferatu, or you could say it like it says on the license plate, Nosferatu. But of course, it's in reference to the vampire Nosferatu. And here we go. Here's the, the thumbnail. Uh, this is by Joe Hill. Christmas Land is waiting for you, it says, uh, as the tagline. You know, Victoria McQueen, the main character, has an uncanny knack for finding things, misplaced bracelet, missing photograph, answers to unanswerable questions, when she rides her bicycle over the rickety old covered bridge in the woods near her house. She always emerges in the places she needs to be. 
but Charles Mance has a gift of his own. He likes to take children for rides in his 1938 Rolls-Royce Wraith with the vanity plate Nosferatu. 2. In the Wraith, he and his innocent guests can slip out of the everyday world and onto hidden roads that lead to an astonishing playground of amusements he calls Christmas Land. The journey across the highway of Charlie's twisted imagination transforms his precious passengers, leaving them as terrifying and unstoppable as their benefactor. Then comes the day when Vic goes looking for trouble and finds her way to Charlie. That was a lifetime ago. Now, the only kid to ever escape Charlie's evil is all grown up and desperate to forget. But Charlie hasn't stopped thinking about Victoria McQueen. On the road again, he won't slow down until he's taken his revenge. He's after something very special. Something Vic can never replace. As life and death battle of wills builds, Vic McQueen prepares to destroy Charlie once and for all, or die trying. Such a good book, guys. Uh, that's a good description on the back of the book. Oh my god. Kat says, anything by Joe Hill is excellent, and she is right. And that brings me to my second favorite read of 2020. Heart-shaped box, also by Joe Hill, of course. Sooner or later, the dead catch up. That's the tagline. And this is such a great premise, guys. This is what it says here. Aging death metal rock legend Judas Cohen. Cohen. I can never pronounce stuff you guys know. Aging death metal rock legend Judas is a collector of the macabre, a cookbook for cannibals, a used hangman's noose, a snuff film. But nothing he possesses is as unique or as dreadful as his latest purchase off the internet. A one-of-a-kind curiosity that arrives at his door in a black heart-shaped box, a musty dead man's suit, still inhabited by the spirit of its late owner. And now, everywhere Judas goes, the old man is there, watching, waiting, dangling razor blade on a chain from his bony hand. And again, it's like a very, like, ghostly mystery. Very, very good. All right, The Good Demon. This is my third favorite book of 2020 that I read. We all have demons. Claire wants hers back. It wasn't technically an exorcism, what they did to Claire. When the Reverend and his son ripped her demon from her, they called it a deliverance. But they didn't understand that Claire and her demon, known simply as her, were like sisters. She comforted Claire, made her feel brave, helped to ease her loneliness. They were each other's only. Now Claire only comforts are the three clues that she left behind. Be nice to him, June 20th, and remember the stories. Claire will do anything to get her back, even if it means teaming up with the Reverend Son and scouring every inch of her small southern town for answers. But if she sacrifices everything to bring back her demon, what will be left of Claire? Oh my god, so good. I love this book. It might be one of my favorite books of all time. And again, this is the book that kicked off my love of reading, my my discovery of my love of reading was this book. I read 10 pages and I thought that would be it, but I couldn't put it down and I read it in 24 hours. So unique twist on an exorcism tale. It's really more of like a young adult novel. I gotta say, guys, if you like occult stuff, if you like creepy stuff, or if you just like a good kind of um, growing up, coming to terms with who you are type of story, this is it for you. I really gotta mention quickly these books. Okay, so last time I said honorable mention... The Ninth House. So good. Oh my god, so good. And Stephen King, he, he loves it because it's about real people. He said that the author's imagination is brilliant and the story is full of shocks and twists. And it's impossible to put down. That's what Stephen King said about this book. I gotta say, it's so good. Again, it's got an occult element. It seems to be something I like is occult elements in the books. But whatever. It is what it is. I kind of read a little bit about it last time, so I'm not going to read it again. But essentially, a, a tale of a girl who's very troubled, but somehow she gets a scholarship to Yale. But the caveat is that she has to kind of monitor Yale's secret societies. And what the secret so societies are doing are very sinister things to keep the rich people rich. And, like, you know, it's kind of... They're doing all these, uh... Se like, not seances, but they're doing rituals and all kinds of ceremonies to stay rich and to find out stuff and to, I don't know, to stay in power. So yeah, it's kind of cool and there's a whole big mystery behind it. And the cool thing is like, it takes place at Yale, like a real life place. So it's very descriptive. It's, it's not a true story, even though some people might argue, oh, there's probably, there probably are secret societies that are like magical and evil at Yale. But apparently 
you know, I'm sure there's really not really, but you could argue that maybe there's something afoot at Yale and like for real, but no, it's not real. Uh, again, this is kind of how they describe it. Alex arrives, arrives in New Haven tasked by her mysterious benefactors with monitoring the Yale secret societies. Their eight windowless tombs are the well-known haunts of the rich and powerful from high ranking politicians politicos to wall street's biggest players their occult activities are more sinister and more extraordinary than any paranoid imagination might conceive they tamper with forbidden magic they raise the dead and sometimes they prey on the living so yeah it's great it's a great great mysterious novel uh, okay and so my final honorable mention, I love this author. His name is Grady Hendrix. He loves Stephen King, by the way. He's done like a whole, he's got a blog. He hasn't updated it in a while, but he did a whole big Stephen King reread, and he reviewed every Stephen King thing he read. And like, of course, it's not the first time he's reading it. It's like his second time or multiple time reading all of the Stephen King stuff. So, oh my God, I love Grady. Uh, it's a very unique name, by the way, his name, Grady Hendrix. This is how you spell it. See, G-R-A-D-Y-H-E-N-D-R-I-X. So this book that I loved, My Best Friend's Exorcism. As you can see, it looks like a VHS cover, kind of. You see this? It even says VHS on it. It's kind of, I, I don't know how it came broken. But anyway, it looks like a VHS, and I love that about it. Uh, it's so cool. It's set in the 80s. It's got all these song references and lyrics in it. And uh, it even says, Be Kind, Rewind, at the top. This little yellow sticker. But yeah, then there's a sticker to say it's a novel. So Grady Hendrix also wrote this uh, book called, like, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. That's one of the books I'm most looking forward to reading in 2021 this year. But yeah, this, this book in particular is very heartfelt. Let me try to see what they say the description is. Okay. High school sophomores Abby and Gretchen have been best friends since fourth grade, but after an evening of skinny dipping goes disastrously wrong, Gretchen begins to act different. She's moody, she's irritable, and bizarre. Incidents keep happening wherever she's nearby. Abby's investigation leads her to some strange discoveries, and by the time their story reaches its terrifying conclusion, the fate of Abby and Gretchen will be determined by a single question— is their friendship powerful enough to beat the devil? We'll have to see. Well, you'll have to see, because I read it. Very heartfelt ending. I could barely talk. Okay. Every stream, it's something. Every stream, whether it's sour candy and me crying, or Jackson barking, or me losing my voice, which isn't really because I'm not drinking enough water, or not, I'm drinking a lot of tea, actually. But anyway. It's because I was talking all day at the cooking show I was floor directing for. And so now I'm like, because I just talked for two hours here. And I'm like, Ugh, I can't even speak. But yeah, again, one more time. I sold, I sold it short a little bit. This is a great book. I got to say, Grady Hendrix, if you don't like this book, he's got a ton of other great stuff. He might be one of my very favorite authors right now. So good. Joe Hill, him, uh, Lisa Jewell. Oh, yeah, good stuff. And right now, I'm reading a book by Stephen King that Kat gave me. Uh, it's really, really good. I'm really enjoying it so far. And if I could talk, I would talk more about it. But I'm, like, literally dying here. Dying! So I'm going to wrap it up right now. I hope you guys like my picks for favorite stuff and uh, least favorite stuff, too. Movies, TV shows, books. I sound like a dying frog. Anyway, the Stephen King book I'm reading, Full Dark, No Stars, really good so far 50 pages in i'll update you guys thanks so much for watching i'm sorry about my voice oh my god <clears throat> i keep not being able to talk so i am going to go rehydrate and try to not talk for the rest of the night thank you guys for hanging with me happy 2021 happy new year you guys are awesome all right see you guys thank you <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm so funny losing my voice it's ridiculous ah! That's my final word. Bye. Love you guys.